Greetings, everyone. Our intro music for today is from Hussein Al Jazmi. He is a singer from UAE, the United Arab Emirates, uh, but is very popular in Egypt as well. And uh, in that music video, uh, it's uh, these are scenes from from Egypt. And I chose that piece of music because I like that it gives you uh, a little glimpse of contemporary Egypt. Whenever we think of Egypt, I think there's a, there's a tendency to uh, recall uh, the most kind of iconic uh, images of, of a very ancient period in Egypt's history. Uh, and indeed, most of the time, when you're in a class like this, uh, World History 1, the first half of it, you encounter Egypt once, that's in this very ancient period, uh, and then it just kind of uh, fades away. Now, unfortunately, I, I have to admit that we're going to kind of fall into that same trap. We are going to talk about Egypt several uh, more times after this, um, but uh, this is the only session that really spots, spotlights uh, Egypt. So what I'm trying to do, the point that I'm trying to make is, is that just to remember that there's a lot more to Egyptian history and, and Egypt's place in world history than just the, the very ancient civilization uh, that developed there along the Nile River Valley. Uh, Egypt is, is a very modern country today. Uh, it's a major uh, player on the world stage. Um, it, it's a vibrant and uh, dynamic culture. And so I, I think that, that this music from, uh, from Hussein al-Jazmi kind of um, indicates that a little bit. This session, the first Urban Societies 2, um, is, is the second of our series. And dare I say, it deals with the uh, perhaps the most famous uh, of all of the uh, urban level ancient societies, uh, and that is Egypt. Egypt is a great topic for this course for a number of reasons. Um, the first, and uh, also one of the main reasons why ancient Egyptian civilization is so well known, is because there's an extremely rich body of historical evidence that was left behind uh, in this place. And so we, we simply know a lot about it. Uh, we have a lot more kinds of evidence. There, there's a range and a density of evidence from ancient Egypt that simply does not exist in uh, a lot of other ancient cultures. And uh, some of that has to do with the, the types of things that the Egyptians made, but then also their environment. Um, you know, they, they were uh, in an environment where a lot of things could be preserved. But uh, a second reason why Egypt is so great for our course is because it, it fits in very well with the big theme of, of this class, uh, which is the relationship between environment and society. In Egypt, in this early period uh, of Egyptian history, um, th that relationship is just very apparent. And if you're wondering um, what are some of the basics of that relationship, you guessed it, it, it has to do with the Nile River. Let's take a look at our thesis for today. Egypt's environment had a very discernible impact upon its early culture. The cyclical flooding of the Nile inspired a notion of stability and regularity in Egyptian cosmology. Additionally, the contrast between the fertile lands of the Nile floodplain and vast barren desert gave rise to a kind of dualism permeating Egyptian culture. All right, so let's think about um, what the question for this thesis is. Here's a, a thesis statement that is, uh, you know, th this is one of the most concise, kind of direct uh, arguments that we have um, for the entire semester. And it's really trying to drive home this point that the culture of ancient Egypt was influenced by the environment and, and vice versa. Uh, 
And so the whole rest of this session is going to be examining some examples uh, of how that happens and why. So what we need then is a question that, that is about that very issue. Uh, and it needs to be broad enough to kind of uh, encompass all of the things that this argument is trying to say. Stability, regularity in Egyptian cosmology, the contrast uh, that leads to this dualism, uh, this, this very discernible impact. So a good question for this thesis would be, what was the influence of Egyptians... Uh, of, let me try this again. What was the influence of Egypt's environment upon its early state-level civilization? Big, broad question, uh, and uh, a, a uh, correspondingly uh, uh, kind of broad thesis statement for that as well. Here is a satellite image of the part of the world that we are talking about. Uh, so over here, this is this is the Sinai Peninsula. Uh, here's the Mediterranean Sea. Here's the Red Sea. Uh, this is the northeastern corner of Africa. Uh, and, and this today, this whole, basically all the this entire picture is is the modern nation of Egypt. So, uh, but let's just looking at this um, topographically. Are there any features that immediately jump out at you on this map? If you said, hey, look at this big stripe of green right here in the middle of this huge desert, you are right on the money. That is, of course, the Nile River, and up here in the north, uh, uh, dumping into the Mediterranean, is the Nile Delta. We can go all the way back to the ancient Greeks, a writer named Herodotus, who um, noted that Egyptian civilization would have been completely impossible without this river. The Egyptians themselves, as we will see, were very aware of this. The Nile is the world's longest river. Uh, it flows some 4,000 plus miles from way down in the south Lake Victoria all the way to the northern tip of the African continent. In antiquity, in the, the era that we are discussing today, it was teeming with plant and animal life. So not only was it a source of water, but all kinds of other stuff too. I mean, it was really, look at that piece of green and, and think of that as it, it's, it's a sliver of life just vibrant life uh, uh, sandwiched between this, th these, these two vast areas of desert. Where did the Egyptians come from? Great question. And interestingly, uh, the Sahara Desert, the, the, the largest desert in the world, and the one that is in uh, the northern part of the African continent, was dry during the last ice age, uh, okay, as it is today, but it actually became a lush savanna that was dotted with a bunch of lakes uh, in the Neolithic era. It actually had a monsoon season in this period. So that's quite different from uh, the way that it is today. The Nile Valley, what we were looking at in the previous image, was a very dense and forested swamp. What this meant for the people that lived here was these early Saharan people practiced both pastoralism and agriculture. They lived clustered around these lakes that were dotted out there in what is today the Sahara Desert, uh, and they also kept herds of animals. We see evidence for this in Saharan rock art. Uh, so here's, here's an example of uh, uh, the depiction of an elephant. Now today, you don't have elephants in, in the Sahara Desert there. That's a, a sub-Saharan uh, uh, animal. And this image here shows people swimming in a body of water. And it's way out in what is today part of the Libyan Desert. 
it was only when the climate shifted once again that humans moved back into the Nile Valley. The Sahara dried out. It became a uh, relatively uninhabitable desert. And the marshy swampland around what is today the Nile River also dried out and, and coalesced into the Nile River Valley. Um, that, va that river valley was very conducive to the cultivation of crops. So what you're seeing here in these images is uh, uh, the migration from what is becoming the Sahara Desert into the Nile River Valley. All of this information is compiled from archaeological remains. So you can see that in this earlier period, 85 to around 7000 BCE, settlements are spread way out all over the place. Uh, there's a bunch of them out in what is today the Sahara. At this time, it would have been this uh, uh, lush green savanna. You can see it start to migrate and, and get more clustered around water sources as time moves forward. And then by the time we get to about the uh, 6th millennia BCE, it's very clearly uh, clustered around the Nile River Valley. So it's this migration, th this last panel here, that migration is, is really the birth of Egyptian uh, society. <coughs> Excuse me. The Nile is obviously a source of water, uh, but perhaps more importantly than, than the water that the Nile holds is the behavior of that water and the fact that the river floods regularly. There are three seasons in Egypt and they are all based on stages of the river. So the, the river determines the seasons. Think about that for a second, illustrating the, the centrality of the river. These three seasons are about 120 days each. So you have, you know, instead of the year being divided up into quarters, it's divided up into thirds. Uh, the inundation season, this is when the uh, Nile is expanding, uh, uh, overflows its banks, uh, and um, reaches a uh, flood stage. There is the emergence season. This is when the water level is slowly receding back into the banks of the Nile. That's about 120 days. And then there is the drought season when the river uh, uh, dries up to its, its lowest ebb before uh, the floods once again return. Now you can see in this image, this is a picture from contemporary Egypt, but you can very clearly see the stark contrast between areas that get flooded and those that do not. So, you know, here, here's these patches of green, and then just beyond it, uh, uh, the dwellings kind of becoming uh, sparser and sparser. But, you know, the water goes up to here, uh, and that's it. The places that don't get irrigated, uh, flooded, it, it immediately goes to a sandy desert. So, this is uh, a, a very central feature of life here in the stages of the river. What happens though if the floods don't come? What if, what if the water does not reach that point uh, that you were expecting? Well, as you can probably anticipate, uh, it causes big problems. Anytime the, the um, cyclical flooding of the Nile it does not proceed as anticipated, it causes a major crisis in, in Egyptian history and in many cases uh, it, it can result in the downfall of the ruling dynasty. So very clear the linkage between the environment and uh, how it affects the social, political, and cultural life here. The Nile was also an important communication and trade corridor that eventually helped to knit different regions of Egypt together. The Nile is one of the few major rivers around the world that flows south to north. Uh, you know, so th this is actually kind of rare around the world. It's a little bit more um, familiar to us here because the Red River flows in the same direction, south to north. Uh, 
Uh, the Nile, of course, is much, much larger than the Red River. Uh, but this is, this is a key feature of the Nile, uh, and that is the reason why Upper Egypt is, is down here in the south. Sometimes you'll see uh, that, uh, uh, well actually no, it, it is on this map as well. So Upper Egypt here is in the south, Lower Egypt is in the north, because that's the direction that uh, the river flows. On the other hand, the prevailing winds in this part of Africa blow north to south, the opposite direction. What does this mean for communication? It means that it's very easy to uh, travel along the river from south to north because you can follow the current and then you can turn around and use the prevailing winds to sail back upstream. It's extremely easy to do this, very convenient. Uh, and that's what you see on the left here is some sailing boats um, plying the Nile River. This meant so the, the ease of commun or the ease of transportation that the river provided, and then also the fact that settlements along the Nile are all clustered in this this you know kind of north south orientation. Everything is hugging the river. Everything is within this river valley. Um, you don't ever really need to venture out to the east or west very much, and you can easily use a boat to go uh, up and down. There's very little need for, say, wheeled overland transport uh, early on in, in Egyptian history. So the, that innovation of, of the wheel uh, uh, and the chariot and wagons and things like this, that actually uh, comes from somewhere else. Egyptians do eventually use chariots and, and all those types of things, but um, uh, that's a technology that's invented elsewhere. It's not particularly necessary uh, uh, from the get-go in Egypt. Egypt is also um, sort of circumscribed, uh, and this has to do with, with the river as well. So to, to the north, obviously, you have um, the Mediterranean Sea. You have deserts on both sides, east and west, uh, and then even to the south there is a barrier. Uh, these are known as the cataracts. There's a series of them, uh, six in total, and they are uh, kind of what separates Egypt from the region to the south, which is known as Nubia, or Kush. Um, it is now uh, part of the modern nation of Sudan. These cataracts, you can see, uh, here's a picture here of one of them. Uh, they're rapids. Uh, this is the first one at a place called Aswan, uh, which on this map is all the way at the north there. So first, second, third, fourth, fifth, a series of rapids. Initially, they were impassable uh, to, to the early Egyptians. You, you can't sail over these things, and, and you have to kind of go swing way around mountains and other overland barriers to get through. And so, you know, this was um, a, a kind of natural border. It formed a kind of natural border that uh, circumscribed Egypt. The Nile was all of these things then. It's, it's a source of water. It's a source of uh, plant and animal life. It is a, a transportation route. It is a, a protective uh, barrier, keeping uh, potential invaders at bay. It's all of these things, and as you might expect, occupied a very prominent place in Egyptian culture from early on. The Egyptians knew that they owed the river everything. So uh, it was not Herodotus the Greek who, who was the first to, to kind of make this realization. Uh, it was very clear to, to these people the centrality, the importance uh, of the river to their way of life. And we can see all kinds of evidence for this. Uh, uh, one um, a really evocative piece is this, the Hymn to the Nile. Basically, it is a big list of all of the things that the river provides or makes possible uh, to, to the Egyptians. It dates from around the 22nd century BCE. Um, and uh, interestingly, it is a hymn that is sung to the river um, 
personified. So the river is actually personified as a as a being, as a deity, uh, and one that deserves thanks for for this benevolence that it has provided to the people there. All of the great bounty uh, that Egyptians enjoy is is from this great and generous uh, uh, river deity. Uh, and so it's it's a it's a hymn of supplication, if you will, uh, and and it's one you know in which the um, the great gratitude is expressed uh, for all of these wonderful things that the river provides. Here's another kind of piece of evidence that is along the same lines, uh, uh, a, a artifact that illustrates the, the centrality and importance of the river to the Egyptian way of life. Uh, this is known as a as a Nilotic scene uh, from the tomb of Nacht. Uh, it dates from the 14th century BCE. Just take a moment to uh, consider this uh, uh, painting and what you see here. How do these things relate to the Nile River? What activities are being depicted? Well, let's start at the center. Uh, here we have uh, grain, wheat being grown out in the fields, people harvesting. As you can see, the river is right there, and uh, that is indeed where the fields are, along the riverbanks, because the river provides irrigation for crops. In the river, fish and, and people harvesting, uh, um, fishermen you know, taking fish, uh, also other large game animals like hippopotamus. These larger figures threshing the wheat, right? You can see that the river is a source of um, bird life, right? Birds cluster there to uh, eat fish of their own, uh, uh, skim through the water, uh, and, and they are then used by, by humans. Now, as we go around, around the sides here, what, what are these things that's being cultivated? Grapes. And grapes are being pressed into wine here. We have another scene of, of a uh, group of fishermen hauling this just enormous net of fish that's bursting at the seams, right? And in the background, uh, grain, once again. Here is a person, uh, it looks like skinning uh, some sort of animal. Uh, those appear to be you know, ducks or swans or something like that. Fishermen carrying fish once again. So er everything you see in this image is it's derived from the river. All of these things then are being brought uh, uh, and offered as tribute uh, uh, to the rulers and deities of Egyptian culture. The other inescapable feature of Egypt's landscape, if we think back to that satellite image, you know, the, the green line jumps out at us, that's the river, and it is set in relief by the desert. That binary, in fact, uh, permeates Egyptian culture as well. Egyptians divided the world into Kemet and Desret. Kemet was the black land. That was the land that saw the Nile floods, that was the land where life was possible. That was the land where you could grow crops. Desert was everything else, the red land, the desert, right? Where there, there is no water, there is very little rainfall. Uh, life is extremely difficult to sustain out in the desert. That little sliver of cultivatable land is only a few miles wide at some points uh, in the Nile River Valley. In some places, it, it squeezes down to just a few hundred yards. So you can see as, as the river carves its way through uh, broader plains and then narrower valleys, sometimes the river valley gets uh, narrower. That's what you see here on, on this bend here. Um, and so the, that little thin sliver of life, if you will, might be just a couple hundred yards across out in the middle of this, this vast desert. <laughs>
Uh, the desert, though, you know, it's not it's not kind of all bad. Uh, the desert, the red land, uh, also offered the Egyptians a kind of protection. It was yet another kind of natural barrier, along with the Mediterranean, along with the cataracts, uh, and so it it helped to circumscribe Egypt. It was also a source of ores, gems, and stone for building. The Egyptians built out of stone extensively, and that's one of the reasons why many of their monuments survive and are still with us today and have become so iconic. So the, the desert does have these things to offer, um, but it, it's an extremely dangerous place to be. Living in this lush uh, river valley is full of life, uh, and you can look just beyond the edge of the floodwaters, though, of, of the flood line, and see um, this, this barren land in, where, in which life is, is extremely difficult. So kind of, uh, you know, death is, is just, uh, just beyond that border, ever present. Now, I, I find that contrast to be very evocative, and the Egyptians, I think it's fair to say, found it to be very evocative as well. Uh, this binary be between a, a lush incubator of life and just absolute death uh, uh, on the other side of, of a, a border uh, that's not too far away. And I, I think that it, it resonates with us today because um, on a larger scale, it is what we all face as uh, inhabitants of this planet. Our species lives in this thin sliver uh, of biosphere that comprises just a small portion of the Earth's atmosphere, uh, a little bit of the, the areas uh, of surface water on this planet, and you know just just a few hundred meters or so uh, below the the Earth's crust. That's the only places on, on this entire planet where life as we know it is possible. Uh, and um, we're out in the middle of this vast universe. Our, our, just our solar system is uh, uh, mind-bogglingly enormous. Uh, and we know that our solar system is one of many, many millions out there in the universe life is totally impossible everywhere else, at least in our own solar system. And, and so, in, in a way, we are kind of all Egyptians, uh, you know, living in this, this little bitty incubator of life with certain death surrounding us at all times. And um, I, I'm not the first one to kind of make this uh, comparison. It, it reminds me of a famous speech that was given by uh, an astronomer called Carl Sagan, uh, who you may know from the series Cosmos, which has now been redone with Neil deGrasse Tyson. Uh, but Carl Sagan was very famous um, as a, he, he was a, a kind of public scientist in the 1980s. Uh, so people who are my age uh, uh, remember him quite well. And in uh, a, a special uh, broadcast on Valentine's Day 1990, he gave this really moving uh, speech that is known as, uh, or, or describes rather this picture, which he called the pale blue dot, uh, and it's a it's an image from the Voyager One spacecraft uh, when the spacecraft turned around, faced back towards Earth, and took a picture, and then uh, uh, the scientists who received that that data uh, converted it into this this visible image, where you can see that that little tiny speck uh, is Earth. So think of you know the vastness of our planet. Whoosh, that's it right there. It's just this little bitty dot. Uh, and Voyager one at this time wasn't even out of our own solar system. Uh, it just kind of illustrates how vast the universe is uh, and, and what we are surrounded with, and how important it is therefore that we maintain our biosphere. Uh, it, it is truly a matter of survival. But let's get back to Egypt. We mentioned that the, the people, um, or actually, I don't know that I did mention it, but the, the people who migrated into the Nile River Valley as, as the uh, climate of the Sahara uh, 
uh, changed once again towards being a desert and dried out. We already have evidence that they domesticated animals by this point when they moved into to the Nile Valley. Uh, that starts around um, around 8,000 BCE or so. And uh, the once in the Nile River Valley, the cultivation of wheat and barley really takes off and becomes more and more of a focus. Um, so that is when the, the kind of shift towards a more kind of full-blown sedentary agriculture occurs. Uh, again, it's, it's because uh, that's something that is possible and in the Nile River Valley and, and that cyclical flooding of the river really is conducive to, to growing seasonal crops. By about 4000 BCE or later, people living along the Nile Valley are scattered in small farming communities uh, and, and simple chiefdoms. So why did they start to cluster together more and more? Uh, well, that's an interesting question. And um, the Nile does sometimes, the Nile floods do sometimes fail. They, they don't come as, as predicted. And in those times of crisis and famine, it's, if you're growing crops, it's, it's advantageous for you to have um, as great a surplus as possible and more people, a denser settlement, uh, you do have more people to feed, but you also have the potential to create a greater surplus. Uh, you know, so it's kind of, um, you, you almost see an, an exponential sort of growth uh, in terms of the amount of surplus that's possible as farming communities become bigger. And so that is um, advantageous in times of crisis. Uh, it means that your your group is more likely to be able to weather uh, uh, a food shortage, uh, absorb some sort of calamity uh, if it's larger. And this this is especially true for uh, sedentary agriculturalists. On the other hand, um, it, we have we have sort of a feedback loop going on, and that is that more surplus also seems to correspond quite strongly uh, in world history with more violence. Now why might that be the case? Well, the more surplus you're able to amass, the, the more potentially lucrative it is for an outside group to come in and take what you have. Uh, so that means you have to defend against this outside group, and guess what? Here again, your, your defense is rendered more successful if you have more people. So the more concentration of resources that you have, the, the better able you're a, you, the better able the group is to defend those resources. Uh, it, it's sort of it's it's a thing that they, they sort of go hand in hand and kind of reinforce one another in this big feedback feedback loop, and that's probably what explains uh, the clustering that's going on here in what's known as this pre-dynastic period of Egyptian history when. Um, small villages start to become larger and larger and cluster together more. At this time, Upper and Lower Egypt are culturally distinct. They are not unified. We're not talking about a, a single state uh, uh, that, that governs all of Egypt, um, and we're not even talking about a, a group of city-states like in Mesopotamia where one is preeminent. Uh, it's really two quite separate cultural zones and then a bunch of little communities and small towns within those zones. Here are some examples of uh, the, the different artifacts from Upper and Lower Egypt. So the Lower Egypt it ten tends to see these more kind of sweeping, sinuous uh, uh, figurines. Uh, upper Egypt, uh, very different motifs, like this one here, a uh, uh, jar with a ship motif. That's kind of similar to this, this ivory comb uh, decorated with what appears to be a giraffe. Prior to the emergence of an overarching Egyptian kingdom, these uh, two cultural zones were relatively isolated for centuries, Lower Egypt and Upper Egypt. That begins to change as the population grows. And remember that, that that's a process. Uh, as, as you concentrate more and more on agriculture, uh, 
your population does indeed grow, or at least uh, it's possible that it grows, uh, tends to grow. Um, but this takes a long time. So it, it's not something that just kind of starts and then you know, within a few years or even generations happens. Uh, it takes a long time. There's more evidence for trade and contact with outside groups as the population of Nile River Valley settlements grows. Probably in, in, in what is similar to the development of Mesopotamian city-states, this increased population leads to greater competition over resources, greater competition over uh, um, economic uh, things, trade, trade routes, uh, and this leads to rivalries. That culminates in the unification of two lands. The, these big rivalries culminate in the unification of Upper and Lower Egypt under a figure, figure who is known as Narmer, also uh, Menes. So th those names are interchangeable. Narmer was the first pharaoh. We have an artifact that tells the story of Narmer's conquest. It is known as the Narmer palette. It's, the, uh, it's actually a, a makeup kit, uh, so it, it would be used for, for mixing cosmetics. Um, and what do we have going on here? Well, on the left is what is known as the smiting side. Uh, and that's because the central figure here is Narmer, uh, the man of the hour, the hero of the story. And sure enough, he is smiting a defeated enemy. He's about to bash this guy over the head with a club. He is wearing the white crown. You can't see that it's white, but uh, uh, that is the white crown of Upper Egypt. The, it, it looks sort of like a bowling pin, uh, but that, that's the crown that the rulers of Upper Egypt wore. Uh, over him is the god Horus, uh, who is depicted as a bird here, perched on papyrus. Now, why is that significant? Because Horus and the papyrus are a symbol of Lower Egypt. Aha. Just to kind of drive the point home that Narmer is a guy who cracks heads uh, uh, and gets what he wants. Uh, he's the guy who has kicked the asses of everyone who stands before him. He is indeed standing over conquered enemies. On the right, you see what is known as the procession side of the Narmer palette. Uh, here he is once again, uh, the hero Narmer. Uh, note that he's, he's depicted as being physically larger than everyone else. This is something that um, is often done in artistic depictions of rulers, not just in Egypt, but in, in many, many cultures. Uh, the, the ruler is, is larger, right? Because he's, he's more important. Uh, he's the central figure, and so that you know, his physical form is, is kind of exaggerated uh, in a lot of these art artistic depictions. But uh, here we have um, uh, Narmer and his sandal bearer, you know, indicating that uh, he's the guy uh, on top. He is presiding over a procession of uh, his soldiers um, and the bodies of defeated enemies who have been decapitated. Uh, so really hammering the point home, right, that Narmer the Conqueror. Uh, we see mythical creatures on this side, uh, the, these sort of kind of combinations between a, a lion and a giraffe, uh, and then down here there is a bull knocking down the walls of a city. In other words, uh, Narmer and his armies have destroyed Right? They, uh, any city fortified uh, location that stood up to them ha has been crushed. And you see that's what's going on uh, down here. So th this particular artifact dates from about the 31st uh, century um, BCE. Narmer's uh, conquest initiates a new period of Egyptian history. The unification of Upper and Lower Egypt into the dynastic era. This also begins uh, the position of the pharaoh, Narmer being the first. Here we have uh, another depiction of what I was talking about earlier with 
the uh, crown of Upper Egypt. When Narmer conquers Upper and Lower, that crown is combined with the crown of Lower Egypt, which is this uh, sort of cone-shaped, it's, it's sort of an inverted cone-shaped thing with that little uh, doohickey there uh, on the top. Uh, that's combined to form the unified crown, or, or the combined crown, that all subsequent pharaohs uh, wear. And why is that? It's because the position of pharaoh, what does it mean? It means the ruler of both Upper and Lower Egypt. That's literally what, um, uh, what it denotes. And so Narmer is the first to kind of set this uh, pattern. Subsequently, we have alternation between uh, Egypt being unified as one kingdom and what are known as intermediate periods in which that unification fragments. Uh, but then it's put back together. There, there are, uh, I think, two or three intermediate periods uh, interspersed with these dynastic eras. The first of which is the Old Kingdom. Uh, it lasts for about 500 years, beginning in 2700 BCE. Uh, it is here where um, a lot of the foundations of Egyptian society are laid. And a lot of the most famous stuff about ancient Egyptian society comes from the Old Kingdom. You know, so just the uh, the things that you think about when you think of ancient Egypt, most of it is is from the Old Kingdom. At this time, the territory of Egypt, the actual excuse me, the actual kingdom, was just this thin little sliver. Uh, in this map, it's the orange, this thin sliver that encompasses uh, this part of the Nile River Valley down to the first cataract and the, the Delta. It is an era of state formation. The government becomes more and more centralized uh, and that power is centered on the Pharaoh's court at Memphis. The Pharaoh is in his position because he is a God King. He is responsible therefore for all of the rituals uh, that tend to Egypt's many gods. The Pharaoh himself is divine. Uh, he, is, he is the um, embodiment of uh, Horus while he is alive. And he continues to be a divine after death, becoming the embodiment of the god Osiris. But what is Horus's role in the pantheon of Egyptian cosmology? Horus is the embodiment of Ma'at. Ma'at is an Egyptian concept that kind of encompasses ideas of truth, order, balance, justice, and rightness. These are all of the things, every, everything that is good and proper uh, uh, and orderly is Ma'at, and it's the Pharaoh's job to maintain Ma'at. If he does not do his job, things will become unraveled. Instead of truth, you will have falsehood. Instead of order, you will have disorder. Instead of balance, you will have uh, uh, imbalance and chaos. Instead of justice, you will have uh, lawlessness and injustice, these types of things. And so, this is the Pharaoh's central and important task, maintaining Ma'at. Now, the Old Kingdom is also where the most famous monumental architecture of ancient Egypt comes from, that being the Great Pyramids of Giza. And, as you all know, uh, they were constructed by ancient aliens. Okay, no, not really. That's, that's not true. Uh, I just love poking fun at that show because it's so ridiculous. Uh, pyramids actually came from a, a well-established architectural tradition, uh, and they are based on an earlier style of monumental burial that is known as the mastaba. Mastaba means bench. And so you have a, a mastaba tomb looks like this. Uh, it, it's a, a big bench that is built over uh, uh, graves of some wealthy, influential, important person. 
uh, to kind of symbolize their, their position and immortalize them after death. There was a guy named Imhotep, a uh, really interesting figure in, in Egyptian history. Uh, you, can, you can read about that in your textbook. But this person got the idea of stacking mastabas into, uh, kind of stacking them one on top of another uh, and into a pyramid, the result being a far more impressive structure. Uh, you see that uh, pictured down there at the bottom in the Step Pyramid of Dozer. Dates from the 27th century BCE. And so then the next development is to kind of smooth out uh, these lines and, and you have um, the, uh, the iconic pyramids that we know, um, like the ones at Giza. They are indeed the most famous examples of pyramids built under the pharaoh Khufu, circa 2650 BCE. Uh, that's about halfway through the Old Kingdom. And, you know, just think about some of the symbolism uh, the, the symbolic and practical importance that these pyramids uh, possess. Not just their religious significance. Uh, obviously, they're, they're deeply intertwined with Egyptian cosmology and, and thoughts about the afterlife. Uh, they, they are a, a sanctuary for the pharaoh and his attendants after death. Um, but also, the, just the, the material wealth, the power, the influence, the, the ability to amass resources and labor, that's, that's people, that the Egyptian rulers possessed, that is, is made manifest in these grand monuments. Uh, that is perhaps the, the clearest message that the pyramids give off. I mean, these things are amazing. Uh, they're, they're one of the biggest tourist attractions in the world. People go there because they are awe-inspiring. Uh, and, and they're awe-inspiring even for us today. Think about uh, uh, just the, the kind of jaw-dropping nature of structures like this in, you know, we're talking about the, the third millennia BCE. Uh, it, it's really hard to overstate. Behind all of that, keep in mind, any anytime you, you have something like this, uh, it's a very clear message that this person controls a lot of people. The, the amount of labor to get this done, I mean, my goodness. Uh, and so the pharaoh uh, is, is a, a person of influence indeed. The pyramids also tell us a, a great deal about the, the specifics of Egyptian religion uh, and cultural ideas about uh, uh, governance, the afterlife, etc. Central to that is, is the pharaoh and his role. He is divine in both life and in death. And um, the that that divinity of the pharaoh it really comes from the Osiris myth in Egyptian cosmology. Osiris was the first divine ruler of Egypt. He was a symbol of ma'at, justice, order, truth, uh, balance. But he was murdered by his evil brother Set, who is the personification of disorder uh, uh, and and lies and deceit and chaos. So Set murders Osiris. He then cuts up Osiris's body and scatters it everywhere. Uh, so uh, Osiris is unable to uh, um, come back together. He's unable to survive this because he's in all these different pieces. Another deity, the goddess Isis, collects all of the pieces uh, of Osiris's body except um, his member. And she's unable to resurrect Osiris until he is complete. So she fashions for him a golden phallus. He was the original gold member, folks. Uh, but once Osiris is rendered complete in this fashion by Isis, uh, they are able to uh, become intimate and Isis gives birth to Horus. Horus, uh, she, she nurtures Horus as a mother. Horus goes on to battle Set, his evil uncle, defeats Set, and restores order. Uh, this is the foundation of the, the pharaonic ideology 
so the Pharaoh is the is the uh, is Horus in life. It, it is an incarnation of Horus and becomes Osiris after death. So Osiris is, is the embodiment of Ma'at, right? Horus is is the defender of that. He he's the one who defeats Set, defeats uh, uh, disorder, imbalance, chaos, as as Horus did with Set, and and therefore restores it and maintains it in in the world. This this is precisely the role that the Pharaoh plays, um, and this cycle between uh, life and death is is crucial to the person of the Pharaoh when he's alive, and then his role even after death. Which is one of the reasons why you have these elaborate uh, tombs built in ancient Egypt, uh, the pyramids. In time, all Egyptians um, came to... Uh, well, initially, I, I should say that initially the, the idea of an afterlife, the, that cycle, uh, uh, was only available to the pharaoh and some other very elite people. In time, though, that comes to be seen as something that is really available to everyone. And uh, that has to do with the fact that in Egyptian cosmology, the soul is not one thing, but it's actually two. You have what is known as a ka. Uh, that is the... Um, that's kind of the life force that animates your, your physical body. Uh, and then you have a ba, which is more of who you are. It's kind of your personality and what makes you, you, is the Ba. Uh, that can survive. Uh, and it can survive so long as there is a vessel for it to inhabit. And so, this is why um, it's important to maintain the body of the Pharaoh or, or the other deceased. Uh, because that's a place where the Ba can then inhabit uh, after the person has passed away. So here is where mummification comes from. Mummification, as you might expect, this is a very expensive process. Uh, not everybody can afford to be mummified, uh, but it's not just pharaohs. And initially, it's mummification is just for the pharaoh, uh, but later, it, it, essentially anybody who could afford it could, could become mummified, uh, and you, you basically get to keep your body uh, after you die. Whatever the case, and even if you couldn't afford to be mummified, uh, you couldn't afford a fancy burial uh, or a tomb, all the Egyptians believed that they would be judged by Osiris in the afterlife. Uh, Osiris is the pharaoh. Uh, the pharaoh becomes Osiris after he dies. Uh, and so, kind of, the, the record of your deeds is quite important in that judgment. How do you know what you're supposed to do? How are you supposed to prepare for that judgment? Well, um, it comes from what is known as the negative confession. Just because everyone is going to have an afterlife doesn't mean that it's going to be the same experience for everyone. Uh, you will go to either paradise or a realm of suffering, depending upon your deeds in this life. Does that sound familiar? Well, it probably should. It's it's very much like the uh, Judeo-Christian idea of heaven and hell. And indeed, Egyptian cosmology has a huge impact upon uh, the religious belief, religious beliefs and ideology of the Hebrews. So the negative confession then is, uh, it's, a, it's a list of 42 sins that you, if you can tell um, Osiris that you have not done these things, then you will be allowed to go to paradise. You will be favorably judged. Uh, what, what you do is you're, uh, you, you make this confession to Osiris, uh, and then his attendant, Anubis, who's pictured here as a jackal, weighs your heart versus a feather on the scales of justice, And if the person's heart is lighter than a feather, 
then they are indeed a good person, their confession is true, and they can go to paradise. Here's Osiris up here. Uh, he's presiding over this whole thing. Well, what are some of the sins that you're not supposed to do? Robbery, violence, murder, adultery, lies, blasphemy. Uh, does that list sound familiar? It also probably does uh, because it's very similar to the Hebrew Ten Commandments. The way that the negative confession works, you know, I, I have not lied. I have not committed adultery. I have not stolen something that is not mine. You say all these things uh, to Osiris, you're then your, your heart is weighed by Anubis and you go to either heaven or hell. So pretty clear that, that this ideology ha has a big impact on other groups, uh, not least of which is the Hebrews. Egyptians also invented one of the world's few original writing systems. We're going to come back to, to that in greater detail uh, later, but just a quick preview of the, the Egyptian writing system. Like the Mesopotamians, they used materials that they had on hand. Uh, for the Egyptians, that was papyrus, uh, this plant that you see up here. Uh, they, they took the husk of the papyrus plant, kind of unfolded it, dried it out, and pressed it together to form this uh, sheet. Uh, and then they would write uh, using uh, a quill uh, with ink. They developed different scripts that could be used by different classes of people. Uh, so you had the, uh, the what we're looking at here is the hieroglyphs. That's kind of the, the high priestly uh, script that would be used for monumental architecture and the pharaoh's tomb and things like that. Uh, a shorthand for that called hieratic was developed um, that the, the educated people used. Uh, and then a, an even simpler version was derived from that known as demotic, uh, which that was kind of the everyday uh, script that um, anyone with uh, a reasonable level of education, anyone who knew how to read and write, for your everyday uh, uh, goings on, everyday business, you would use demotic. So by, by the time we are into the Old Kingdom, we have the major components of Egyptian civiliz civilization is in place. You've got a centralized government uh, ruled over by a pharaoh. Uh, backed up with a, a uh, ruling ideology that you know is, is culturally situated and, and has all of these um, uh, uh, ways that it's tied in with the the life of the place uh, uh, is imbued with with meaning uh, uh, in different capacities and is very closely related to the seasonal flooding of the Nile. Um, that seasonal flooding is uh, evident in many of the other cultural practices of Egyptian society. And along with this centralization, we see the emergence of the first cities in this region. We see developments in art, in architecture, in medical technology, uh, the invention of a writing system, and then further elaborations of uh, this, this mythology and a pantheon of deities. Uh, all of these things exerted a, a very clear influence on subsequent groups. Uh, it wasn't just the Egyptians, but you know the, the Egyptians kind of influenced everybody. Certainly the people around the Mediterranean, they, they were a big influence on the Greeks. They were a big influence on the Romans. They were a big influence on people like the Phoenicians, uh, uh, the Hebrews, as, we, as we've mentioned. So the, the legacy of Egyptian civilization uh, uh, is, is uh, very broad indeed. Eventually the initial kingdom, the, the old kingdom, did decline though and uh, there was no longer a, a single pharaoh in control of all of Egypt. Uh, why did that happen? A couple of things. You had a, an old ruler named Pepe II. Um, ha, has a great name, but he, he was on the throne for 
perhaps as long as 90 years. I mean, this guy was just, you know, he's like, um, he's like Elizabeth II or something. I mean, he just uh, uh, wouldn't go away. But anytime you have a, a ruler who is around for such a long period of time, even if they're a capable ruler, uh, this can create problems with succession because the, the heir, the person who's supposed to take over, um, is sort of waiting around uh, year after year to, to do so. Uh, and it also means that other potential heirs, even uh, a generation or perhaps two removed from the current ruler, have started to come of age and, and are you know, maybe um, thinking that it's possible for them to jump the line, so to speak. Uh, in this case, um, uh, towards the end of his reign, uh, Pepe II was not quite as effective as he had been, and his regional governors, the, the people who he delegated responsibility to to administer various areas of his kingdom, um, more or less became independent. They just didn't have to um, do what the pharaoh said, and there wasn't a whole lot that the central government could do about it. Uh, these government governors ruled over what are known as gnomes, um, their administrative districts, uh, essentially like provinces. Uh, and so you have all these different provinces kind of doing their own thing. And then right in the middle of this potential, uh, you know, powder keg, this, this unstable situation, there's a huge famine that's brought on by the Nile not flooding. Now that, even under the best of circumstances, would cause a major crisis. In this case, we have a crisis hitting an already stressed and fragile uh, socio-political system, and the whole thing just busts apart. So that's something that we see a lot of in world history. When you have an environmental disaster hitting an already stressed system, uh, and that is, is the death blow that uh, uh, rends the society apart. That's precisely what happens here with the Old Kingdom in Egypt. The result was a, a century, a full century of crisis uh, uh, that uh, is known as the First Intermediate Period. The central government has no revenue, uh, the pharaoh has no power, local governors refuse to give up their positions or to listen to the center. Everyone's just kind of uh, uh, doing their own thing. At precisely the time in which a strong central government is needed to deal with a crisis, uh, uh, things are trending in the opposite direction. What we're looking at here is, is an artifact from a tomb from this period. It's known as the tomb of Anktifi, and as you can see, depictions of starvation uh, on this frieze here. The inscription from this same tomb uh, is quite uh, dire as well. The whole of Upper Egypt died of hunger and each individual had reached such a state of hunger that he ate his own children. I mean, talk about bleak. Now that is probably a bit of hyperbole there, but nonetheless it's clear that this was a really serious crisis. People starved to death, um, uh, and well, what's suggested here is is uh, uh, cannibalism. No food. So that picture that I put up here on the left is, uh, you know, what happens when the Nile doesn't flood the way that you expect it to? You can see the the earth just completely dried out, uh, uh, and not even the grass able to grow. Uh, Egypt is eventually reunified after this crisis. It takes some time, um, but then is conquered by an outside group known as Hyksos. Uh, that kicks off the second intermediate period uh, and then is reunified again. Uh, so th these are kind of some, some details that we don't have time to go into. Uh, but just to point out that we do have this kind of cycle between unification, dissolution, reunification, uh, and in the case of Egypt, it's, it's either due to an environmental catastrophe or an outside invasion. So those two things really crucial in, in kind of determining uh, um, the uh, uh, success or failure of a 
socio-political system. Uh, here we have, this is, we're not going to go into some details here, but these are just images of some uh, Egyptian ruins at a place called uh, Abydos uh, down in uh, Upper Egypt. Great examples of, of kind of monumental architecture and, and things like this. Uh, another one, uh, really fabulous, uh, you can see monumental complex here. There's an overhead map of it superimposed over the actual ruins themselves by a place called Saqqara. Uh, but let's talk about this comparison with Mesopotamia. What are some of the similarities between Mesopotamian society and culture versus Egyptian? At, its, at the most basic level, there's, there's a lot of kind of fundamental structures that are the same. You have urban centers. Uh, both of these are uh, 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 urban societies, so the first cities in, in both cases. Right? The, the Mesopotamian city-states are a little bit earlier, uh, uh, but uh, in both cases these are the first cities, uh, period, in, in their regions of the world. You have institutionalized forms of government, not tribal forms of government. Uh, those institutional forms of government, more details in a future session, um, but uh, backed up with a very well-developed ruling ideology, a, a very strict socio-political hierarchy, a, 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 uh, a political, a socio-political hierarchy that is uh, uh, very big. Right, so the space between the pharaoh or the priest king and the person at the bottom is vast, uh, and in many cases this is a hereditary uh, hierarchy. Both Mesopotamia and Egypt had the same staple crops: grain, wheat, uh, and they both heavily relied upon irrigation, river irrigation, to make their way of life possible. What are some of the key differences, though, that we see? Well, one is their conception of the gods. In the Mesopotamian case, the gods are capricious. They are arbitrary. They are, in general, um, wrathful, vengeful. They don't particularly like human beings that much. Not so in the case of Egyptian gods. There are some evil deities like Set. Right, who is uh, uh, everything that is bad, right? Chaos, disorder, injustice, etc. But for the most part, the, the pantheon of Egyptian gods is populated by benevolent deities. And certainly the most important deities in the Egyptian pantheon are benevolent. They provide, they sustain, uh, they offer fruits and blessings to humans, they take care of humans. Uh, this is quite a contrast. Also, in their conception of the afterlife, the Mesopotamians didn't think that there was much of an afterlife. If it was there, it was probably not so good. In the Egyptian case, very, very well-developed uh, notion of an afterlife, and one that was uh, really a reflection of your life on Earth. That your, your life on Earth continued after death, and your place in the uh, social hierarchy continued as well. If you were a good person in your life on earth, you were blessed and allowed to go to paradise in the afterlife. Uh, if you were not, you were, you were doomed to um, uh, a place of punishment. But nonetheless, um, that's not something that really exists. In Mesopotamian culture. Now think about what might be responsible for that difference. How might the physical environment influence those different conceptions of deities, of humanity's place in the world, and of the afterlife? Here are your key terms for today's session. The first urban societies, two, Egypt, and the Nile.